right, so welcome everybody uh, to the last session in this particular series. And uh, as we get to the end, we will have a glimpse of some of the sessions, exciting sessions which are coming up uh, over the next um, period of time. Uh, but <clears throat> for our session tonight, last week, on the last, on the last occasion that is, we looked at the Messianic era from the perspective of how it will happen, the way in which the Mashiach emerges and his very specific qualities. This week, we're going to look at what will happen. In other words, what will life be like in the era of the Mashiach? What's going to change? What's going to remain the same? In a sense, we've touched on some of these in, in previous lessons of the course, but tonight we're going to get a, a much better look and we're going to focus on really some of the, the very fascinating teachings about the Messianic era. Um, remember the, the famous um, American baseball icon, Yogi Berra? Well, he very famously on one occasion said, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Well, that of course only applies to human predictions, even for the cleverest person. But on the other hand, the rabbinic scholars who discussed what the world will look like in the era of the Mashiach were applying their, applying their interpretive skills to God's words in the Torah and to the prophetic verses that we see in Isaiah and in Jeremiah. Uh, and therefore they were comfortable to a certain extent in discussing what the future would look like. They weren't pulling it out of the air, so to speak, even though they understood as we will ourselves discover tonight, that this is not, not everything in this subject is in fact knowable. Uh, because by definition, the discussion of this topic is, is incomplete. And I suppose a good way to, to look at it is to think about tonight's lesson as the, a movie trailer. So in a movie trailer, you don't get the entire storyline and you don't even know how the plot's going to end. But if it looks like a sufficiently interesting movie, you're going to want to wait to watch the whole show. And I guess that's the way in which we should be looking at our lesson tonight. And throughout tonight's lesson, once again, we're going to be relying very heavily on Maimonides, because he is the most authoritative and widely accepted commentator on all of these issues, both in the last two chapters of his huge legal codification called the Mishnah Torah, that are devoted to this whole subject, and also because of a very significant letter that he wrote to the Jews of Yemen that we'll come across a little bit later tonight. So the questions for tonight are as follows. What will life be like in the Messianic era? In what ways will things change? And in what ways will they stay, in this, stay the same? So we're going to start tonight by reading a passage from Maimonides, in which he wants to say, uh, and it is very much his view, that there will be no miracles during the era of the Mashiach. And when we use the word miracle in this context, we mean a fundamental change of the way nature operates. According to Maimonides, such miracles simply won't occur in the Messianic era, even though there will be some amazing and some pretty dramatic changes but they're changes which are going to take place within nature. They're not going to be miraculous. And so we need to have a look at our first text tonight, text number 1a, which is on page 247 of your workbook. So it's very short and I shall read it to you. Do not presume that in the Messianic age any facet of the world's nature will change or that there will be innovations in the work of creation. The world will continue according to its pattern. Well, that's a bit puzzling because then why do you need Mashiach? However, there is another text from Isaiah, which of course Maimonides would have known because Isaiah lived a long time before Maimonides and Maimonides would have known all the prophetic works, which seems to contradict him. And again, it's a short text. It's on page 248 this time and it's text 1b. And it's a very, very famous text from Isaiah. Uh, and it reads as follows. The wolf will dwell with the lamb. The leopard will d lie down with the young goat. The calf and the yearling will be with the lion. And the little child 
will lead them all. And that seems to imply a very, very miraculous change in the nature of the world. And it seems to contradict what Maimonides has just told us when there'll be no miraculous changes. So Maimonides, of course, himself preempts this question by telling us the following in text number 1c now, which is on page 249. And I'll read it again just to finish the sequence. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the young goat, quoting from Isaiah. These words are an allegory and a parable. The interpretation of the prophecy is that the Jews will dwell at peace together with those wicked Gentiles who had sought to devour them like a wolf and a leopard. They will no longer steal or destroy, but they will live at peace with Israel. And similarly, other messianic prophecies of this kind are allegories. Only in the messianic era will we understand the true meaning. So according to Maimonides, there will be no miracles, no altering of nature as we know it in the messianic era. Lions are going to remain beasts of prey and sheep are going to remain, well, I suppose, sheepish. And when we encounter a prophetic statement that sounds miraculous, we have to assume that it's a metaphor. And the meanings of these metaphors, at least many of them, he says, are unknowable. Yet, as Maimonides does suggest, does suggest the meaning of this particular allegory of the wolf lying with the lamb, it means that the wickedness of anti-Semitism will finally cease. And by all accounts, this would amount to a very welcome major sociological change in the world as we will all, would all appreciate. So, in text number two, on page 250, we have the following statement again from Maimonides. Our sages taught in the Talmud, there'll be no difference between the current age and the messianic age except the emancipation from our subjugation to Gentile governments. And that's taken from the Talmud. He's quoting from the Talmud. So here we are. Nature will continue. As you see, the lion red in tooth and claw. And miracles or verses, miracles will occur. The lion lying with the lamb. Those are the two possibilities. And Maimonides comes down very strongly on the first. Nature will continue. So in this passage that is quoted from the Talmud, Maimonides continues to emphasize his point. He negates miraculous change and he highlights in this particular quotation a second example of unmiraculous change. The first one being that the non-Jews are actually going to like us for a change. There will no longer be anti-Semitism. The second one is, based upon this reading over here, that no longer will Jews be subjected to non-Jewish rulers. Now, you might well, well think that we've already achieved the end of foreign subjugation because today we're blessed with the, to have the state of Israel protecting the lives of millions of Jews in the, in the land of Israel and throughout the world. Yet anyone who follows the news will really understand that actually we are not quite free of non-Jewish rulers just yet. So much of what Israel is able or unable to do, even regarding matters relating to essential security, really depends upon the will of other, of other nations, and particularly the world's superpowers. So when we say that Jews will be free from non-Jewish rulers in the Messianic era, we mean completely free of all foreign influence, pressure, or political impetus. Jews will then use this power, our autonomy, our complete and total autonomy, to spread light and kindness throughout the world. And that is what we aim for. So there's <coughs> um, an, another area, um, apart from the end of anti-Semitism and this concept of Jewish independence that will transpire in the Messianic era 
Uh, and one of them is in text number three on page 251. Again, it's short, so I'll read it. The Messianic will, King will arise, once again from Maimonides, of course. The Messianic King will arise and renew the Davidic dynasty, restoring it to its initial sovereignty. He will build the temple and gather the dispersed of Israel. In his days, the observance of all the statutes will return to their previous state. Well, let's try and unpack what, a, what all of this means. So in the last lesson, we discussed the meaning of the first clause of this statement over here about the restoration of the Davidic dynasty via the person of the Mashiach. And this is then followed by the teaching that the Mashiach will rebuild the temple and the Temple Mount in the same location where the first two temples stood. And when that happens, the third part of the statement over here is that will then enable the restoration of many mitzvot that involve the service of the temple. So, an end to anti-Semitism is one of the places where we start. Jewish independence and that is what the Mashiach is going to do. He's going to renew the Davidic dynasty. He's going to build the temple He's going to gather the dispersed of Israel and he's going to re restore the observance of all the mitzvot and all of that is contained in our text number three. Those are the elements of text number three. Uh, by the way, the historic hope for the rebuilding of the temple is expressed in many different ways uh, in all of our classical texts, but one of them is the imagery which constantly is presented throughout the ages in the Pesach Haggadah, in conjunction with those songs and prayers about the restoration of the, of, of the temple. And here is an example from a Haggadah which was published in Vienna in 1730. And you can see this in figure 6.1 on page 252, or you can see it on this next slide. So here in this slide, and if I just remove myself for the moment, from this, so you can see it a bit bigger. And there you have in the Haggadah a picture of the temple and who you bane bet bakarov. It's taken from one of the songs, Kadoshu Rachum Hu, da 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 da, who you've never all that kind of stuff, and a picture of 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 the temple. And for our next slide, since we are talking about the temple, here is a short video which shows the history of the temple and its the way it was constructed. God told the Jews at Sinai to build a temple so that his presence could dwell among them, a place to worship to gather as a nation, to receive atonement, inspiration, and instruction. Half a millennia later, God's desired location for a permanent home was revealed to King David in the ancient city of Jerusalem, atop a hillside known for Abrahamic times as Mount Maria. David's son, King Solomon, completed a magnificent structure that attracted the title Beit Hamidash and Beit Hapira. It was fashioned with much gold, expensive woods, and precious materials. When it was completed in 827 BCE, the nation gathered to witness God's presence fill the temple. The mountain gained a new name, Har Habayat. At its summit, a stone building rose to enormous height. Within its gaping entrance was the Ulam, a lobby beyond which was the Kodesh, furnished with three golden items, an altar for incense, a seven-branched menorah, and a table with racks for the showbread. At the sanctuary's far end, 
A separated area enclosed the temple's core, its most sacred location, the Kodesh Hakdashim, that held the Oro, the Ark of God, containing the tablets that Moses delivered at Sinai. The Ark of God rested upon a naturally protruding plateau, known as the Foundation Rock. Immediately outside the building, the courtyard of the Kohanim, priests, held a massive stone sacrificial altar with a lengthy access ramp. Nearby was the Kior, a cistern for rinsing hands and feet, and a platform for the Levites to chant psalms and play instruments. Further back, a larger area was designed for public assembly, known as the Woman's Courtyard. It included an extensive wooden balcony for women. The nation would gather three times each year to celebrate the festivals of Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. The compound was surrounded by a massive wall and contained a series of steps, numerous gateways and guard posts. The temple's layout was exceptionally efficient, with compartments and chambers for every possible need, such as storage areas for wood, oil, and other materials, production and preparation areas, rooms for clothing, for weaponry in case of attack, ritual immersion pools, sleeping and eating areas, tool and instrument reserves, lockers for the priests, a charity room, a hall for Torah study, a chamber for the Sanhedrin, a lounge for temple officials, a repair workshop, animal holdings, ticket stations, and so on. There were separate entrances for distinct purposes, an oversight system, and honor guards. A small stream ran beneath the temple, which was used to maintain cleanliness. The temple stood for four centuries, it was destroyed by the Babylonian army in 423 BCE, rebuilt in 349 BCE, and stood for four centuries more until it was destroyed by the Romans in 69 of the Common Era. Through his prophets, God promised the Jews a third and eternal temple in the Messianic Era, from which his presence will spread to the world, embracing all of humanity. And of course, um, it's timely because this Sunday will be Tisha B'Av, the day of destruction of both of those temples. And as you can see, just about the only thing that was missing from that huge complex was a gym. No gym. Yeah. But maybe the third temple will rectify that. And a nice Olympic-sized swimming pool would probably do the job as well. Uh, and then you can charge people entrance, you know, in times times to to come along and be, be a nice turn it into a cultural center there you are yeah at any rate you see the problem is this exile is a state of concealment first the babylonians and then the romans raised the temple and today as a result of all of that there are voices now that declare that jews have no rights to the temple mount and as you know voices that want to shout very loudly that we have no right even to the land of Israel. But it's part of our belief that in the Messianic era, everyone will recognize the value of the temple. And this concept is one of the really underlying messages of the many prophecies that highlight, highlight how all the nations will pay homage to the third temple. And you'll see this in text number five. I'm, on page 254. Although, I'm sorry, we need to come back to a text. Um, um, sorry, I need to just step back a bit because I've, I've just gone a bit ahead of myself. So let, let's just pick up where the video ends. So today, as you know, there is another building or other buildings of note on the Temple Mount. And I suppose one of the hardest things for us to possibly imagine is how in the Messianic era, the nations of the world, including those in the Middle East, will apparently be very happy to enable the building of the Temple. I mean, at this point in time, that seems completely and totally inconceivable. As you know, you can't take a spade and turn over a clod of earth without a great protest, you know, from the 
other side of the Western Wall, uh, that we are interfering with, the, with their holy site. But it's always been part of our belief that the um, spiritual influence that flows from the temple is really for the benefit of all nations, not just for Jews. And in the Messianic era, when God's presence will be palpably felt, the entire world will recognize the huge value that the temple has for them as a source of physical blessing and of spiritual direction. Indeed, if the nations of the world had realized this, they wouldn't have destroyed the temple in the first place, but they would have invested huge resources to protect it. And that's our text number four on page 253, which reads as follows, taken from the Midrash. If the nations of the world knew how beneficial the holy temple was for them, they would have surrounded it with fortifications in order to guard it. Instead, they destroyed it. And this brings us back to this idea that exile is a state of concealment, and in our state of concealment, uh, even the right to the land is being questioned. And this brings us then to text number five, this idea of how all the nations will pay homage to the third temple and how it will be there for all the nations of the world and not just for the Jewish people. That's on page 254. It's taken from, from Isaiah. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, prophesied concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall be at the end of days that the mountain of God's home shall be firmly established at the top of the mountains. It shall be raised above the hills and all the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall go and they shall say, Come, let us go up to God's mountain, to the house of God of Jacob, and let him teach us his ways and we will go in his paths. And so you see from prophecies like this that the Jewish vision of redemption is not exclusive to Jews. In God's concept of a perfect world, the era of the Mashiach, it's not one in which only Jews are present. Non-Jews will remain non-Jews, and they too will experience redemption. They will observe the seven Noahite laws of Noah, as many already do today, and they'll look to the Torah for moral inspiration. But this, by the way, does not imply that non-Jews have to convert to Judaism, because God has a purpose for both Jews and non-Jews, and that will be retained and perhaps become even more apparent in the Messianic era. So it's really important to understand that redemption in the Jewish perspective is a universal concept not a particular one that applies only to Jews. We're talking about the world, all of mankind, and not just us. In that text that we read, Maimonides mentions how the Mashiach is going to gather Jews from all the corners of the world and return them to the land of Israel. Let's just talk about this for a moment. When Maimonides wrote this code, he was really exact in his writings. The order of how he presents material is not random, including here, where he places the ingathering of the exiles after the building of the temple, although both come about through the Mashiach. And this indicates that the, that the ingathering will in fact be triggered by the power of the temple. Jews have, can and have always made the choice to move to, to Israel, but what's going to be unique about the messianic ingathering of the exiles is that it's going to be qualitatively different. Jews the world over will be drawn like a magnet by the supreme sanctity of the third temple, not by persecution, as has happened for so many, aliyah from persecution to the land of Israel. But people will make their, their way to the land of Israel not just because of anti-Semitism in the countries in which we live 
or because uh, they want to have a, you know, a home in Israel, etc. But it'll have a magnetic pull. There'll be something of a spiritual nature that will stir us in the core of our souls and we'll be drawn to that place. There have been lots of aliyahs during history, but this sort of aliyah hasn't occurred yet. And that's the one that's going to occur in the Messianic age. In all the previous aliyot, many Jews remained behind in the diaspora. But a temple-based aliyah will be so completely different that all Jews will be inspired by it and they will want to have a share of its environs. They'll want to be there, will be drawn to it. One of the most fascinating issues related to this subject of the ingathering of the exiles, about, by the way, Maimonides is completely silent, is the whole question of the return of the ten lost tribes. Here is a brief, sto a brief history of what happened. After the reign of King Solomon, the Jewish kingdom and the land of Israel split into two. Ten tribes formed an independent kingdom of Israel in the north, and two other tribes, Judah and Benjamin, together with many Kohanim and, Levi and Levites, formed the kingdom of Judah, with Jerusalem and the temple as its capital. Between the years of 574 to 556, of before the Common Era, the Assyrians invaded the Northern Kingdom a, a number of times and eventually exiled those ten tribes to faraway lands. And this all happened more than 125 years before the Babylonians, who were the next regional superpower after the Assyrians, sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the first temple and exiled the remaining two tribes of Judah and Benjamin to Babylon. So extraordinarily, from this point onwards, what we call Jewish history is merely the history of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, which, by the way, is the reason why we are called Jews. Yehudi from the tribe of Yehuda. We are Jews because of Judah. The tribes of Judah and Benjamin were the ones who experienced the destruction of the first temple, the exile in Babylon, the story of Purim which took place towards the end of that 70-year exile, the building of the second temple, the story of Hanukkah which took place halfway through the 400 year, 410 years of the second temple, etc., etc. All of Jewish history is about these two tribes. The remaining ten tribes disappeared. And where they are, remain shrouded in mystery. The Bible, when it describes the exile, enumerates some of the places that they were sent to. But we've never been able to identify those locations. And for centuries, there's been speculation about the whereabouts of the lost ten tribes. And there have been many, many attempts to try and locate them, or to learn about their fortunes. Can you imagine? Ten out of 12 tribes disappeared. But what's relevant to our discussion is the debate as to whether they are going to be part of the ingathering of the exiles. And Maimonides says nothing about it. But this is what the Mishnah says. Text number 6 on page 255. The ten tribes are not destined to return. As it is stated, God cast them into another land like this day. Deuteronomy, the Torah itself says that. Just as the day passes, never to return, so they've gone into exile, never to return. This is the view of Rabbi Akiva. But Rabbi Eleazar disagreed with him, and Rabbi Eleazar stated, like this day, quoting from Deuteronomy, just as the day darkens and then brightens to form another day, so too the ten tribes who experience darkness will in the future experience light. 
So two views in the Mishnah as to whether the ten tribes will return or not. Rabbi Akiva says no, and Rabbi Eliezer says yes. And I can tell you that on this little passage of Mishnah, there has been major, major commentary and opinions over the centuries. We're going to look at just one approach. One of the commentators in the Mishnah called the Tiferet Yisrael, Rabbi Yisrael Lifshitz, who was an 18th century commentator, 1782 to 1860. And in his commentary on the Mishnah, he offers us the following way to unlock these two opinions in the Mishnah. So first of all, he tells us a fascinating story. He narrows the scope of the debate between Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Yezer by pointing to another Talmudic passage that fascinating tells us that the prophet Jeremiah, who of course lived at the time of the destruction of the first temple, was offered the opportunity of freedom by the Babylonians, but chose and elected to go into exile with his head in chains together with his fellow Jews. He went with the people. He was in Babylon. But says the Talmud, he went on a mission to find and to bring back the lost tribes. And the Talmud assumes that he was successful in bringing back at least some of them. And those who were brought back were subsequently reintegrated into the Jewish people. But they had lost their tribal identity. And, according to all opinions, when the Mashiach comes, their tribal identity of those lost Jews who were recovered will be restored and they will once again know which tribes they belong to. And you'll see in a moment why that's important. So then he goes on to say that the following. So the debate then is between Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Eliezer is about those who didn't return in Jeremiah's time, the ones he couldn't reach, the ones who had assimilated into their local environments. So some retained the tradition that they are Jews, but they had also adopted non-Jewish and perhaps even idolatrous practices. Others had assimilated to the degree that they had lost all memory of being Jews, even as they might have retained some customs that stemmed from their Jewish origins. And you will know that there are many Jews today who are in a very similar situation. People who are Jewish but have lost all sense of identity of their Jewishness. So it is about this remnant that Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Lezer are debating. And Rabbi Akiva is of the, of the opinion that this unfortunate process of assimilation effectively severed these people from the Jewish nation for good. And Rabbi Eliezer believes that nothing could separate these people from their Jewish past. And that when the Mashiach comes, it will become clear to them and to everyone else that they are indeed Jews. And that they will be taking part in the in gathering of the exiles. I remember many, many years ago when I was in business, <clears throat> we had a, um, a salesman. And I was traveling in the car with him, uh, somebody who had simply hired as one of our staff. I was traveling in the car with him and got talking about family. And he says, yes, he says, you know, uh, as it happens, he says, my, uh, my grandmother is Jewish. I said, um, really? I said, is that on your father's side or on your mother's side? He says, no, it's on, it's on my mother's side. So I said to him, you do know what that means, don't you? He said, No. I said, it, it means that you're Jewish. <laughs> oh, come on, don't, don't be silly. He says, we have Christmas trees. He says, we're, we're Christians. We go to church. We do all the Christian stuff. You know, I wasn't quite sure whether I should ask him to stop the car and ask him whether they'd put on to fill in. <laughs> because he's a Jew. They had no idea. And there must have been some of these of the ten tribes who found themselves in very similar situations. So either way... Whether it is whether this remnant comes back or not, but there is, according to that Talmudic tradition, a large number of the ten tribes who were recovered. And so that in the Messianic age, Israel will once again consist of all the tribes. And that is why Jews have continued to take an interest in the tribal division of Israel, not only as a matter of history, 
but even in terms of the future, on the assumption that the land will still have to be redivided into its tribal portions. And again, one example of this brings us back to the Pesach Haggadah, this time to a very famous 1695 edition of the Haggadah in Amsterdam, which included in the back a map, which by the way is one of the oldest extant maps of Israel of this kind, a map of the land of Israel from 1695 divided by the tribes. And you can see this in your workbooks on page 256 in figure 6.2. Alternatively, once again, you can see it in this, in this map. I don't know whether it's big enough for you to see it. You want to look at a full screen, but you see there is from 1695 a picture of Israel. Most people would not have gone and been there and, or ever seen it. And it is divided into tribes. Fascinating. Right. So the next thing that happens and that we need to explore is the restoration of the Sanhedrin. In text number three, that was on page 251, we saw that one of the things that Maimonides said would happen would be after the temple is built and after the ingathering of the exiles, many of the mitzvot will be returned to their previous state. Now, what does that mean? Some of the mitzvot of the Torah require the presence of a king. Some of them require the majority of Jews to be living in Israel. And many, many, many of the mitzvot require the existence of a temple. And without these features of Judaism, of Jewish life, a large number of the 613 commandments cannot be observed. As a matter of fact, you may be surprised to learn, as you know, the 613 commandments is divided into 248 positive commandments and 365 negative commandments. So of the commandments which we can observe, the 248 positive commandments of the Torah, only 87 of the 248 are commandments that we can continue to observe when we are in exile. All the rest of them can't be observed because they're dependent upon a king, the majority of Israel living in the land, the existence of a temple, etc. So with the coming of the Mashiach, the return of Jews to Israel, the rebuilding of the temple, once again the opportunity arises for all of these mitzvot to be observed again. And by the way, one of the most exciting things that, that has arisen for religious Jews as a result of the formation of the State of Israel, our sovereignty li li living back on the land again, is that for the first time in two and a half, two and a half thousand years, um, since our exile in 70 of the common era, we can once again begin to, Im to look at and to implement some of those laws which relate to the land, agricultural laws which have lain unused for centuries and suddenly they're becoming, they're becoming relevant again. And the thrill of you know, um, how, how you deal with the land in the Shemitah year, the seventh sabbatical year, which was totally theoretical for two and a half thousand years is now practical. Um, the tithing, all of these issues are real issues now, exciting because they've come alive again. But the thing which will most powerfully symbolize this change will be the restoration of the Sanhedrin, as Isaiah had prophesied. And by the way, we'll see the, you'll see this prophecy in text number 7, on page 256, and the almost the exact wording of this prophecy has found its way into one of the blessings of our daily Amidah. So it's a short prophecy, it is, reads as follows. I will restore your judges as in the days of old, and your counsellors as, as at the beginning. Vashiva shoftaich kavrishona. Afterward, 
you shall be called the city of righteousness, faithful city. So let's just understand what the Sanhedrin is and why it is so important. So the ancient Jew Jewish judicial system had a highest court, a supreme court. It was called the Sanhedrin and was convened in the precincts of the temple. It consisted of 71 of the greatest Jewish sages in the land, all of whom had received official ordination known as smicha. Smicha is the laying of hands on a person, which, by the way, the laying of hands in Christian theology is derived from this concept over here, that when the tradition was passed on, when a person was given the, or the authority was ordained effectively, it was done with a laying of hands on the person, a smicha. You see this for the first time in the Bible, when Moses ordains Joshua as his successor, and we're told very clearly that he laid his hands on him. So you have to can only you could only receive official ordination smicha from someone who himself had received the same ordination and was an unbroken line going all the way back to Moses. And by the way, just to put this into context, when we talk about a, a rabbi being ordained today, we still use the same term, the rabbi has smicha. But you should make no mistake that this smicha is not the original smicha. There's no one today who has, or not, well, there may be, but the, the certainly the majority of rabbis today who are ordained um, do not have that smicha that has been handed down in an unbroken line from, from Moses. It more or less doesn't exist today, except perhaps amongst some of the greatest. So the Sanhedrin had many, many different powers, and, and it could legislate laws that would be binding on all Jews. Now the Sanhedrin, by the way, was forced to disband around the year 360 of the Common Era because this was a time of intense Roman persecution. But the belief is that it'll be returned, as Isaiah tells us, with the coming of the Mashiach. And most interestingly, Maimonides tells us that it will return, that when it returns, it won't return to Jerusalem, but it was going to re it'll return to the last place where it was convened. Take a look at text number 8 on page 257. Maimonides. Originally, when the Holy Temple was built, the Supreme Sanhedrin would hold session in its chamber of hewn stone on the temple, in the temple. When things went awry, the Sanhedrin went into exile, convening in various locations, ten in total, the last one being Tiberius, Tiberia. Since then, the Sanhedrin has not reconvened. We have a tradition that the Sanhedrin will be restored in Tiberian Tiberius first, and from there it will eventually relocate to the temple. Isn't that fascinating? So what you should be doing is not buying a house in Herzliya. You should be finding a really good plot in T Tiberius on the Sea of Galilee, because you'll be in line then to witness the return of the Sanhedrin. So the rest restoration of the Sanhedrin will, will impact um, in, in, on Jewish law in many ways. Okay, This is the example that the ones who formulated this program, the JLI program, the authors of this, have wanted to give us. I mention that because I'm going to suggest that they missed the point um, or missed an opportunity. So, one example is how we set the Jewish calendar. The Jewish month corresponds, as you know, to the waxing the waning of the moon. And when the Sanhedrin was in existence, the length of a month depended on witnesses who had seen the new moon and who came to Jerusalem to testify that they'd seen the new moon. If they came on the 30th day of the month of, say, Tishrei, for example, and testified before the court that they'd seen the new moon on the previous night, they would be cross-examined and if they were found to be reliable witnesses, the Sanhedrin would declare that day, the day before, 
the, the night that day because they'd seen it that, the previous night, the first day of Cheshvan. If, however, no witnesses arrived, the Sanhedrin would automatically proclaim the new month on the following day. So that is why we can have the new month on either tw the 29th or the 30th day. And the process came to be known as sanctifying the new moon by observation. Uh, but in this model, you would never know the exact night of Pesach, the Pesach Seder, until two weeks before the event. Pesach falls out on the 15th day of the night, of the 15th night, uh, the eve of the 15th of Nisan. And the witnesses would only have come to the temple at the beginning of Nisan and declared, you know, the, the new moon. You didn't know which day was the new moon, the 29th, the 30th of the month, the 31st of the month, etc. So you only had two weeks before you would find out when Pesach was. After the Sanhedrin ceased to exist, a 4th century sage by the name of Hillel, not the same Hillel as the famous Hillel in Ethics of the Fathers, who had lived a number of centuries before, was the, himself the, the chief of the final Sanhedrin, and brilliantly he designed a full Jewish calendar for all future generations, the calendar that we still rely on today. And as the leader of the Sanhedrin, he had the power to sanctify months and years for all future generations until the coming of the Mashiach. Because that was a power vested in the Sanhedrin. So with the restoration of the Sanhedrin, we'll return to the observation, old observation method. And this is going to, therefore, constitute a major change in Jewish practice, particularly regarding holidays. And the whole issue possibly of one day and two, yom, two days Yom Tov would be coming to all of this. So for those of us who love moon watching, you just might find yourself being able to take part in this mitzvah and rushing to Jerusalem to testify before the Sanhedrin that the um, new moon had arrived and you would actually have a special role in the outcome of the Jewish calendar. I say I think that they missed, they missed an opportunity over here because all of this is very interesting. Um, that's not the first major change that I would have wanted to, to, to say would come about as a result of the, um, the restitution of the, of the Sanhedrin. To me, the most important change that would come about if we have a Sanhedrin is that there would be one single authoritative body to legislate for all of the Jewish people. In other words, you wouldn't have a situation, say, for example, in, um, uh, in Geirut, in conversion, where you have so many different standards of conversion that a person, a convert, can start off in Israel being considered Jewish, land up in London where they would not be considered Jewish, move on to uh, New York where they might be considered, where they would be considered Jewish, uh, and then move on somewhere else where they want, want again, once again won't be considered Jewish. What we are really lacking in the Jewish world today to solve all of the issues relating to women's role in Judaism, etc., is the authoritative, single, powerful, authoritative voice th that, that all, all other religious Jews would heed and follow. And to me, that would fundamentally change the coherence of the Jewish world in which we live. And they didn't mention that, but I think it's really important. So here is our Sanhedrin. Rest restore the observance of all of the mitzvot and they're the 71 judges um, they have smicha the chain of tradition and they are going to set up in Tiberia. Now let's talk about a very fascinating subject. When we talk about dramatic, dramatic, drastic changes all still within Maimonides natural model of redemption we have to address the issue of Armageddon or Apocalypse. Okay. Sorry, I missed that final things calendar as well. A great war will take place in the land of Israel prior to the Mashiach's coming. Let's get some handle on this, a bit of background. Armageddon is the Greek word 
the Greek word for Mount Megiddo, Armageddon, Mount Megiddo. And it is presented in Christian sources as the location of a final battle in the end of days, with, unsurprisingly, Christianity coming out on top. And Christian sources also call this the apocalypse, which is a Greek word for a prophecy about the suffering that will take place at the end of days. Apocalyptic. Now, as we know, many Christian ideas were taken from Judaism, some with more alteration than others, uh, and this is no different. There are numerous chapters in the Tanakh, in our Jewish Bible, that describe a great war that will take place that will occur in the future in the land of Israel. And Jewish sources have understood that the, all of these as references to the era of the Mashiach's arrival. In one instance, the prophet Zechariah says that there will be great mourning in Jerusalem due to the war, and he compares it to the mourning that once occurred in the valley of Megiddon, which is a location in Israel. That's the same valley that Armageddon comes from, the one where the Christians say a great war will take place. It doesn't say anywhere in our sources that a, that a, a battle will take place in Megiddo. All that Zechariah says is that there will be mourning in Jerusalem that will compare to the mourning that once occurred in the valley of Megiddo without indicating what that episode was. So it doesn't say in our sources that a war will be fought there, but for whatever reason, this became the tradition of Christianity, which is why the event continues to be called Armageddon. We, as Jews, call it the Battle of Gog and Magog. G-O-G and M-A-G-O-G, Gog and Magog. Gog, we understand, to be a king, and Magog is the name of his people. So the, name, the battle of Gog and Magog is not Gog against Magog. It is Gog and his people called Magog, the king and his people. And that's the name that we're going to use as we continue over here. And this is all that Maimonides says on this topic. Text number nine on page 259. A straightforward interpretation of the prophet's words appears to imply that the war of Gog and Magog will occur at the beginning of the Messianic age. Before this war, a prophet will arise to inspire Israel to be upright and to prepare their hearts, as it is stated in Malachi, a, a quotation we saw as the last quotation, the last verse of the last book of the last prophet. Behold, I am sending you Elijah. Some sages stated that Elijah's coming will precede the coming of Mashiach. All these and similar matters cannot be definitely, definitely known until they occur, for these matters are not clarified in the prophet's words. So, if we were hoping that Maimonides would employ, employ his great knowledge to describe what this war will look like, I'm afraid that we, are, we have been disappointed because he tells us almost nothing. His reasoning is that this subject cannot be known because the prophetic words in this topic, similar to some other messianic topics, are too vague. And Maimonides is not going to make it up. He's only going to tell us what he's learnt from the texts. There is a a very cryptic Talmudic passage that suggests another reason why we shouldn't give this matter too much attention. It's not because of what we can't know, but because of what we do know. I'm going to read this text for you and then we're going to try and get to understand it because it's difficult to understand the first time you read it. But after we've explained it, it becomes really, really easy. It's text number 10 on page 260. It's taken from the Talmud. Rabbi Yochanan taught in the name of Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai. Suffering a wayward child at home 
is more difficult than the war of Gog and Magog. For it is stated in Psalm number 3, verse number 1, a psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. And the next verse 2 reads, God, how numerous are my enemies, many have risen against me. By contrast, regarding the war of Gog and Magog, it is said in the previous psalm, Psalm number 2, verse number 1, Why are the nations in an uproar? Why do people speak emptiness? It doesn't state how numerous are my enemies, as it does in the next, in the next psalm. So, what's the message here? So the second chapter of Psalms discusses an instance when the nations band to get band to get band together to undermine the rule of Jewish kings. And the first line of this psalm asks, why are the nations in an uproar? Why do people speak emptiness? Meaning, they're wasting their time. Because he who dwells in heaven laughs. Nothing is going to come of their nefarious plans. And according to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, this psalm is talking about the battle of Gog and Magog. Now the third chapter of Psalms has an introductory verse that provides a, an historical context. King David offered this plea, this cry, when he had to flee Jerusalem because his son Absalom had rebelled against him and had tried to take the kingdom away from him. And his first words are, God, how numerous are my enemies, so many have risen up against me. Ultimately, of course, the psalm concludes on a note, note of hope because we know that King David prevailed against his son Absalom, but the opening verses of this psalm express pain and anxiety. Now, Rabbi Shimon, the one who's commenting over here in this piece, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Yochanan, teaching in the name of Rabbi Shimon, takes note of the proximity of these two psalms and he wants to point out to us their differences. Both of them are addressing a major crisis. In the first, the crisis regards the future war of Gog and Magog. And the thrust of this particular psalm is, it's a commotion about nothing. There's no mention of Jewish anxiety or suffering. The second, the second psalm regards a rebellion from a wayward son, Avshalom. And the expressed pain is acute. In other words, this is the bigger of the two problems. So by analysing Psalm 2 to refer to Gog and Magog, Rabbi Shimon wants to make clear to us that we have nothing to fear because the whole thing will amount to nothing. Don't worry about Gog and Magog. Put it out of your mind. It's not worthwhile worrying about. We don't know what's going to happen, but I'm telling you, it'll come to nothing. It's going to be okay. But you know, that's not good enough for us as Jews, because as Jews, we need something to worry about. So we've got another psalm. Rabbi Shimon says, rather than worry about Gog and Magog, that you can do nothing about, worry about your kids, worry about your wayward children, worry about the education of your children. Because actually we know from other places that David actually overlooked the proper education of Absalom and he became a really spoiled brat with a lot of vanity in his hair and everything else. And these issues of bringing up children is something which parents continue to struggle with to this day. So the suggestion in this wonderful piece of Talmud is, is if you're going to expend your mental energy on anything, let it be a, a real problem that you can actually deal with one that we can rectify by our own choices, rather than things which are completely out of our control and you've got nothing to worry about anyway. And that's the comparison that he wants to make over here. So the second reason why we don't have to worry about Magog and Magog, why we know nothing about it, is because it's, we don't need to. It's not sufficiently sufficient to worry about. So to follow Rabbi Shimon's mandate over here, uh, we should continue, instead of continuing to discuss Gog and Magog, let's talk about Jewish parenting. That sounds like a better theme for a, for a course. Battle of Gog and Magog, the details are unknown, no safety threat, 
So let's focus our energy on the education of our children. God is in one. By the way, there is a Hasidic tradition that the length of the exile over 2,000 years, the huge suffering that has been associated with it, and the suffering that was incurred during the Holocaust has resulted in the complete cancellation of this war in the first place. It won't happen. We've paid enough. We don't have to suffer anymore. Let's come back to some of the prophecies mm. that we dealt with at the outset in lesson number one concerning all of the physical blessings. They were summarized they're summarized here. You'll see this is all from lesson number one. There'll be no more war, no more crime, no more poverty, no so scarcity, no more disability, all of this taken from, from, the, um, from, pro from the, mess the prophecies that we looked at. You'll see this also uh, in fi figure 6.3 on page 262, it's the same as the slide. And Maimonides summarizes um, all of these in the, f in the text, and as we read it, we'll notice again, once again, how nature does not change in Maimonides' model of redemption. But Maimonides is going to point us once again to the goal of messianic abundance. So text number 11 on page 263. So this is quite a long one. And perhaps it's time for somebody else to, time for us to hear somebody else's voice instead of my boring voice all the time. So would somebody like to just read this Text number 11 for us, please. I'm happy to. Thank you, Lan. The Messianic era is defined as the time in which sovereignty will revert to Israel. And the Jewish people will return to the land of Israel. In those days, it will be extremely easy for people to make a living. A minimum of labor will produce tremendous benefits. This is the meaning of our sage's statement that in the future, the land of Israel will bring forth ready-baked rolls and fine green garments from the time of Shabbat. The great benefit of that era is that we will experience respite from the oppression that prevents us from doing good. There will be a widespread increase in, of wisdom, as it is stated, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God. War and battle will cease, as it is stated. Nation will not lift up sword against nation. The human lifespan will be lengthened as a result of the absence of stress and suffering. We do not long and hope for the messianic era simply because we desire an abundance of produce and property, or because we wish to ride horses or drink wine to the accompaniment of music, as some confused people think. Rather, our prophets and pious, pious yearn for that era, because then the righteous will assemble, and good conduct and wisdom will prevail. It will be possible then to observe the entire Torah without worry or fear. Thank you very much. So you see, Maimonides here once again outlines his unmiraculous model for the redemption. We'll work for a living, but very little work will yield a great output. Hooray! No, no more abortive, abortive property deals for those of you who are in property. Humans will live long because of the absence of stress and suffering. Isn't that fascinating? What an insight! Stress shortens life, so does suffering. But they will remain mortal, they're still going to die. Yes, there is a Talmudic teaching about food and clothing growing on trees. Maybe money will grow on trees. But similar to the other words of the prophets, it's no more than a metaphor, the idea that a small investment yields a large return. And a second point that we notice here is why physical abundance is important from a Torah perspective. Not because we're just looking to have you know, a wonderful, wonderful time to be on holiday all of our lives and to indulge in, in physical delights. We look forward to this era because 
as souls and bodies, we want to be a spiritual people and purpose-orientated. In the current state of affairs, despite our best intentions, life sometimes just gets in the way of the better angels of our character. But if we, if we were to live in a redeemed world, free of hassle and heartache, then we're going to be able to live our true selves. And we're going to be able to fulfill the purpose for which God created us. And in a sense, that has relevance even to the way in which we live today, because as we noted in lesson number one, we are living in times of great prosperity relative to our, the ones that our ancestors lived through. And a Jewish way to regard these blessings is to discover how they become enablers, us, enablers for us to spend more time on the things that truly matter in our lives, whether it's mitzvot that concern our relationship with God or with fellow human beings. Minimal effort yields great results. See, there's the drone on the field, enabling a distraction-free life to serve God. Well, all of that is great. Something to look forward to. But there is something we haven't discussed yet. There's one problem to the whole picture that we've drawn up until now. What about Techiyat HaMetim, the resurrection or the revival of the dead? It's a fundamental teaching of Judaism. We mentioned it in lesson number two. It appears in the words of our prophets and it's disguised, discussed many, many times in the Talmud. It's incorporated, as you know, into our prayers and into our funeral service. And the whole concept of the resurrection of the dead, the revival of the dead, does not seem compatible with Maimonides' model of an unmiraculous redemption. As a matter of fact, Maimonides fails to mention this teaching of Techiat HaMetim, Revival of the Dead, in those two famous chapters of the Messianic Age in his work, the Mishnah Torah. And his whole insistence about the lack of miracles highlights this absence even more. So much so that it had led to some scholars of his generation to question whether Maimonides was inching towards an allegorical understanding of the revival of the dead, which would have been radical. In reality, that claim actually had no, no legs. Because as it happens, Maimonides does mention this very important belief, but in his commentary to the Mishnah, where he presents it as one of the 13 principles of Jewish faith that you'll recall we looked at in the previous. So it's there. The revival of the dead is one of the 13 principles of Jewish faith listed by Maimonides. On that basis, he's going to be believing in it. But because of this tremendous confusion around the matter, because, because he omitted it in this great legal work, this compendium called Mishnah Torah, and because there were some Jews, particularly those Jews in Damascus and Yemen, who chose to interpret the resurrection of the dead, Techiyat HaMetim, as an allegory, and they felt that they could rely upon Maimonides. In doing, in doing so, Maimonides felt obliged to write a, a letter, an epistle, on this topic and send it to the Jews of Yemen. It's a very famous letter, and in it he reminds his readers that this belief is not a metaphor. But this forces us, therefore, to revisit our prior assumption, uh, prior assumption about Maimonides' model for redemption. Suddenly it's not so simple anymore, because Maimonides, and Maimonides acknowledges that it's not so simple in, the, in this letter. And here's a bit of it in text number 12 on page 266. Quite a long letter. Time for someone else to read, please. Doris, you going for it? This is the letter on resurrection sent to the Jews of Yemen. You're still, uh, Doris, you're still, you're still uh, muted. Because I didn't realize 
realize that when I stated that certain prophecies are to be understood allegorically, this is not absolute. No prophetic communication informed me that they are allegorical, nor did I receive revision from the sages and prophets that these particular methods are parables. Let me explain what brought me to the allegorical approach. I strive to bring harmony between the Torah and human intellect, which is why I explain things in a natural way whenever possible. However, when it is self-evident that the connotation is miraculous in you, and it is not possible to interpret otherwise, I say that it is a miracle. The bottom line is that regarding specific prophecies about the redemption that do not involve the fundamentals of our Jewish faith, it matters not whether one believes that they are literal or allegorical. We will have to wait for their realization. May it occur speedily in our days to discover whether these statements refer to actual miracles or are simply allegories for natural changes. So that's a bit of backtracking, isn't it? You know, from the certainty we had from, from the Maimonides much earlier on. So actually, Maimonides is acknowledging that there will be many miracles in the Messianic era. And, and even for Maimonides, it's conceivable that delicacies will grow on trees, that the wolf will literally lie with the lamb, that humans will be immortal. But he's saying there's no need for such miracles. The only miracle that must occur is the resurrection of the dead. And perhaps the way to reconcile these two views is to say, perhaps if the Mashiach... Remember we spoke about um, two ways in which the Mashiach arrives. One is if the Jews are worthy, uh, and the other is if they're not worthy and he's going to come eventually in his own time at a, at a specific point of time. That we, we discussed this in the last letter. So maybe if Jews are worthy, there's reason to assume that there'll be an abundance of miracles. Uh, and if Mashiach's arrival occurs when Jews are unworthy, maybe there won't be miracles, except for this one big miracle of Tehir Tim. So, you know, that's one of the ways in which we could reconcile it. And you'd see this over here, uh, many miracles, you know, or unworthy, there's, there's no miracles. The question is why in the Mishnah Torah, which is a code of law, Maimonides negates miracles. Uh, and why, why it does so if he knows that it's not absolute? So one answer is actually pretty much in that letter over there. He chose to, to, to err on the side of the unmiraculous as a general approach. And an additional explanation is that because perhaps the miracles depend on Jewish merit, Maimonides chose to ignore this because a code of law shouldn't state contingencies that are dependent upon Jewish behavior. So he went for the baseline. In any event, as far as Maimonides is concerned, the primary purpose of the Messianic era is to be able to live a godly life without disturbance. And for this, Miracles are not needed. All that is needed is the absence of persecution and anxiety. Absence of anxiety, of course. And these can be achieved by removing tyranny from the world, by taking away anti-Semitism, by providing an abundance for all people. doesn't need changes in nature. The things which we're seeing today, which are the abundance which comes about, are not coming about because nature has changed. It's coming about just through an evolutionary process that we've discussed before. So in his code of law, Maimonides is focusing on the primary function of the Messianic era, and that's all that matters. And that's why he wants to define the Messianic era as unmiraculous, even though he acknowledges in the letter that it could be miraculous as well. So here we are. Miracles may occur, but they're not central to the purpose of the Mashiach. But in this letter of resurrection, of which we've only seen one little bit, Maimonides provides a number of interesting teachers about the interesting teachings about the resurrection. And here is one of them. He asks a very, very interesting question. Did you know that there's no verse in the Torah that speaks about the resurrection of the dead? Isn't that extraordinary? It is so present in our liturgy, in our prophetic writings, and there's nothing, no mention of it in the Torah itself. So why is it, he asks in this letter, 
Why is it that there's no clear verse in the Torah about Techiet HaMetim? There may be lots of hints, but why don't we have a record of Moses conveying this idea clearly to the Jewish people during their stay in the desert? And Maimonides gives the following response in this letter, and we see another snippet of it in text number 13 on page 268. Quite long again, so another reader, please. I can read it. Thank you. The resurrection of the dead will appear as a miraculous event to be explained. However, the credibility of such an event can only be based on the words of a prophet. Now, at the time of the giving of the Torah, nearly all of humankind denied the transmission of prophecy from God to humans. They also denied that God would perform miracles, considering them instead acts of magic or trickery. Indeed, the Egyptians denied that Moses performed godly miracles and tried to show that they could turn sticks into snakes by other means. The Jews themselves were influenced by this worldview, evidenced by their expressing astonishment that God revealed himself to them at Mount Sinai, indicating that they considered prophecy impossible. How then could such a miraculous event that relies exclusively on believing prophecy be conveyed to those who were not ready to accept the concept of prophecy or the concept of a miracle. When God wished to give us the Torah, he first had to produce the great miracles recorded throughout the Torah to authenticate, thereby the prophecy of the prophets and the possibility of miracles. For that reason, at this stage, God only divulged the concept of reward and punishment that occurs within the scope of nature. God did not mention anything about resurrection. This continued until, after the passage of generations, the belief in prophecy and miracles became verified, and there remained no doubt about their truth. At that point, the prophets shared with us the, that which God had informed them regarding the resurrection of the dead. By that time, it was easy to accept this belief. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? So this is a really interesting explanation. And he, what he wants to say is that there are two important prerequisites to the belief in resurrection, the belief in prophecy and the belief in miracles. Uh, and our ancestors over time, they weren't ready for this at the time the Torah was given, uh, but over a period of time, uh, they experienced the legitimacy of both. Um, God did not continue to re-verify these concepts in each generation anew. Instead, he relied on our ancestors to make these truths known by conveying their central messages to the next generation. The first generation conveyed this to their children, but passed to the next generation until eventually it reached us here today. So to this day, we continue to emphasize each Pesach, the miracles that God wrought on behalf of our ancestors that demonstrated his complete control over nature. And on Shavuot, when we celebrate the giving of the Torah, we emphasize the revelation and the prophecy that forged the Jewish past and the future. And that creates the space to continue to nourish this very fundamental belief. Thank you very much, Alan. So here we are. Here are the two requisites. Belief in prophecy and belief in belief in miracles. And if, until you've got those, you can't believe in Techiatamaitim. And therefore it wasn't mentioned in the Torah because these two were not embedded in the Jewish psyche at that point in time. I suppose one has to ask the question, what's the purpose of resurrection of the dead? Why is it so important? And we, by now, we can understand why a messianic world is necessary, because it's going to change the world for the better, and it's going to affect the quality of life for all human beings, and it's going to create the possibility of, of a much, much better, much better world. And that's something which everybody can understand and look forward to and say, yes, I buy into that. I can understand, particularly as it's not going to be big bang, whiz bang, etc. It's going to be natural changes, etc. Some dramatic changes, but there'll be central authority. There'll be, a, you know, a moral, a moral voice. Um, all of those things are great. But why do we need Mechia Tamei Well, there are several answers which are given to that. Uh, and on a basic level, one could suggest as a first answer that it's a matter of reward. Because during their lives, many, many righteous people didn't have it easy. 
and they weren't properly compensated. It wasn't fair. <laughs> they weren't compensated for living, living good and upright lives. And sure, you know, a reward is in the afterlife, but a person is a body and a soul, and they perform the commandments in the body and a soul, and it's, they're deserving of reward. So, Tachiat HaMetim is important because it allows God to bestow reward on the full person, body and soul. And so that's our first concept over here. Reward for body and soul. However, the things we learnt in Lessons 2 and 3 allows for a deeper understanding. The purpose of creation, is to, as we have said so many times, is to create a home for God in the physical world. And every mitzvah performed throughout history contributes to this transformation. Should those who contributed throughout all the generations to this sacred project not have an opportunity to take part in the result? If there's a concept of reward in Judaism, the truest reward is experiencing the direct result of the act. And a soul in Gun Eden is unable to experience God's home in this physical world. When the soul returns to its body, it's able to experience the fruits of its labor, the transformation of the physical world into a vehicle for godliness. And so it's the opportunity to actually experience the results. And a third suggestion is, the very fact that the soul returned to the body demonstrates that the center of spiritual gravity has shifted. Suddenly, for a soul to continue on its path of spiritual growth that we have discussed in previous courses, um, begins to change, and instead of continuing to climb upward, it turns back to the body to experience a different kind of intimacy with God. Because the physical realm has been completely transformed into a home for God, so spirituality is found here in this world. Because the ultimate objective of Judaism is not to transcend the physical, but to transform it. And so the person in the body is where the transformation takes place. And that's the third principle over here. And of course, every act that we perform helps to transform the physical into the spiritual. In a famous passage from Maimonides, which is much quoted, it's text number 14 on page 270. And I'll read it to you. You should view yourself at all times as equally balanced with merits and faults and the whole world similarly, equally balanced with merits and faults. And therefore, if you perform one mitzvah, you tip the balance, your own and that of all man, humankind, and you effect personal and global deliverance and salvation. This is a magnificent quotation because it says that every single human being is important. Nobody is insignificant. Every single act makes a difference. You don't know if your next act is going to tip the balance. And therefore you need to have these souls back in bodies because all of us collectively, each one of us has to perform that next act which could change the whole world. The sense that the whole world depends upon me is very, very powerful. Not because it turns me into an ego, but because it validates my existence and because it tells me that I am important in God's eyes, that I have something to contribute to his world and that I can be as significant and as important as the person next to me because it could be my act that's going to change everything. Because every mitzvah we do reveals the essence of a godly purpose and therefore any mitzvah has the potential to be the final blow the final blow that will usher us all into the era of redemption. I'm going to show you our concluding video and then I'm going to give you a sneak preview of our next courses. So hang in there. Lesson 6 And then 1. 
In his halachic code, Maimonides states that we should not presume that the world's nature will change in the messianic era. Prophecies implying otherwise are to be understood as allegories. That said, this era will be marked by huge changes. 2. One radical change, a complete end to anti-Semitism, and total independence for the Jewish people. 3. Mashiach will rebuild the Jerusalem temple to the applause of all nations who will recognize the benefit that God's sacred home offers the entire world. 4. Non-Jews will also experience the redemption. The Jewish redemption is a universal concept. 5. Building the temple will cause the global ingathering of all Jews who will recognize its great sanctity and desire a share in its environs. 6. The return of the ten lost tribes is a matter of Talmudic dispute. Some attribute the uncertainty to the tribe's assumed assimilation. Regardless, it is undisputed that all twelve tribes will be represented in the land of Israel. 7. The possibility of observing all of the Torah's laws will return due to the existence of the Jewish monarch and temple, and the reality of Jews living securely on their land. 8. The Sanhedrin, forced to disband centuries ago, will return. One resultant change will be that the Jewish calendar will revert to a system of observation. 9. The Jewish prophets mention a great war associated with the Messianic era, but the prophecies are difficult to interpret with any certainty. Rabbi Shimon demonstrates by applying Psalms 2 to this war that the threat and tumult will amount to nothing. 10. The cessation of war, crime, poverty, scarcity, and disability will enable us to fully fulfill the purpose for which God created us without pain or worry. 11. In his Epistle on Resurrection, Maimonides clarified that nature-altering miracles may indeed occur in the Messianic era. We are aware of one, the resurrection of the dead, but others are possible as well. 12. The resurrection is important because it will enable all who participated in making this world into a home for God to share in the magnificent outcome. It will also demonstrate the complete spiritual transformation of the body and, by extension, the entire physical world. And here are the courses that are coming up uh, over the um, for December, February, uh, and May. Um, outsmarting anti-Semitism, Jewish meditation, and a course called Beyond Right: The Values That Shape Judaism's civil code so plenty more to come thank you for participating in this course i hope that you enjoyed it i have lots of questions about resurrection of the dead i don't know where all those people are going to fit in um how they're ever going to be housed uh, in, in 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 israel it's a heck of a lot of people um i don't understand how the temple is going to be uh, rebuilt in the sense that uh, what's going to happen with the existing arrangements, etc. So there's quite a lot you know, to talk about that I don't know yet, but there you are. We'll have to wait and see. Just let me end the recording and then we can talk. Recording stopped.